high on a mountain the warm winds are blowing and where the winds are blowing to there ain't no way of knowing the mountain grass is sure it's drying close to burning crying out for water as the season's turning sweet smell of the pines tall western cedar drifting on the Like a river. I've been too long away from this wild open sky on the concrete trails that wind through the canyons dark and wide. The sounds of people talking. Hello, my name is Ayana Young, and I welcome you to Unlearn and Rewild where we explore radical ideas relating to earth renewal. Today we have Matthew Wood on the show. Matthew has been a practicing herbalist for more than 30 years. He lives on an herb farm west of downtown Minneapolis. He is a graduate of the University of Minnesota and holds a Master's of Science degree in herbal medicine from the Scottish School of Herbal Medicine. Matthew is the author of many books on the philosophy, history, and practice of herbalism. He is a registered herbalist and professional member of the American Herbalist Guild. He is also a regular contributor to the Journal of the American Herbalist Guild. Hello, Matthew. Thank you for joining us today. Hi there. Hi. Mm -hmm. It's such an honor to have this opportunity to speak with you. You really helped shape the revival of American herbalism and your books are among the most widely read on the subject, so it's it's really a great honor for me. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I I heard that you were just returning from Scotland. Uh, uh, the UK or Britain this time? Yeah, okay. I, England. England, I guess. Britain includes them all. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, are you teaching or studying? I was teaching. Yeah, I, I noticed that on your website you have many teaching engagements, so. Um, to our audience, look him up and see if he's teaching near you. So I wanted to start off with reading a quote from your Earthwise Herbal book. Plants are not just slurries of chemicals casually operating together to keep an organism alive. Rather, they are a unity of constituents and functions drawn together under a presiding drive for arc function that can be described as a primal essence of personality. The plant lives in a certain environment and has undergone stresses in the crucible of natural selection. All its constituents, colors, shapes, and adaptations are the expression of a ruthlessly honed individuality. Plants may not be conscious as we are, but their chemistry, appearance, and uses reflect an innate personality as much as they reflect physiology. Yeah. Mm, That was beautiful. So I know holistic medicine has dozens of branches and schools, but if you could generalize at the most basic level, how does holistic differ from reductionist medicine, and why is it so threatening to the Western medical orthodoxy? Well, it's the exact opposite, for one thing. (laughs) Uh, Reductionism, of course, looks for the smallest possible unit or um, active part in the system and presumes and tracks disease down to that lesions um, uh, tracks the problem down to the smallest part in holistic medicine we look for holes that holism the whole picture that is the constitutional type of the person that's why I was talking about the constitutional type of the plant as well in a way and um, in addition to the constitution of the person we look for the major organ systems and what um, uh, kind of major functional units, which are also holes, whole systems within the body, the liver as a whole, the heart, the cardiovascular system as a whole, the digestive system as a whole, and we treat often the whole system rather than some cells in the esophagus or something that are having trouble. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And when somebody comes in with, let's say, a common cold or something like that, you don't just look at 
the cold. You try to understand the reason, the source, and and how the body's functioning altogether, not just maybe the respiratory system or the symptoms of that disorder, disease. Yeah, let's see. Let's take hay fever. It'd be a little easier to talk about. So where is it? Is it more in the eyes? Is it more in the nose? Is it more in the frontal sinuses, more in the um, maxillary sinuses? Is it more on the palate? Is it more in the ear tubes? And then the trigger, what sets it off, pollen or cat allergy or mold like that, that would be the kind of thing we'd be looking for and try to get a whole picture there. And, and a different way to look at it would be, say, a digestive problem. Let's just say it's in the stomach. How do we differentiate it then? We would look for, is it hot, cold, damp, dry, tense, relaxed? Uh, hot would be like uh, excess, if we we're using Chinese terms, yang, and uh, or yin deficiency, lack of water. Um, cold would be lack of yang, yang deficiency. But at any rate, so we'd look for hot or cold, and generally, I just ask one major question to determine that often, which is, are you better from hot food or worse from hot food? Well, not do you like hot food, because a lot of people do, but if you're better from hot food, that generally means you have a, um, a cold condition, and if you're worse from hot foods, like you get esophageal reflux later that night, or immediately, or hyperacidity from overly spiced foods, then you have a hot stomach, because it overreacts. So, so you can quickly differentiate there. And another question, if you have bloating, gas, does it come on suddenly, like a cramp or spasm? That would be a spasmodic condition. Wind, as they'd call it in Chinese medicine, or just tension, as we would call it in the West. Or does it come on slowly and go away slowly? That tends to be dryness, lack of secretion in the stomach. So we have different ways of of differentiating the conditions in the stomach and uh and that would be what's called energetics, hot, cold, damp, dry, uh, tense, and relaxed. Hmm. You've also written about the importance of understanding the history and culture surrounding a plant medicine to fully grasp its medicinal properties. Um, this initially gave me pause because the plants contain medicine regardless of our knowledge or lack thereof. Yeah. But then I thought, well, maybe we are all co-evolving and our relationship is also just as dynamic then there's the concept that disease is not static but it's a combination of imbalances and deficiencies and as our society moves even further away from nature diseases change yeah. um, so why is the cultural context of plants so crucial could you help us understand this concept yeah well I would say it probably you, you can study the plant independently of the cultural use but the the culture has had hundreds or thousands of years of experience with it and they've honed the use of that plant to an art or just even to a first single uses here and there they know what it really works for well and they're the first people to ask you know and they uh, no longer sometimes are people out in the country but you know books that have the opinions of people from the last couple hundred years and so that's a strong um, start and we should always I think um, conduct a search of the historical literature as well as the pharmacology and I think like a plant like elder where they they which is used for viruses that has been used that's been used for flus for hundreds of years for influenza and then they did scientific research on it to determine what's in it and how it acts and they kind of worked in line with the traditional uses whereas echinacea um, was used very differently by the Indians of the pioneers and you know there's been trouble getting echinacea to work in test situations and I think it's because they're not using it the way that it was originally used mm -hmm. so that's that's important I had not thought of your your idea, which I think is really important, that is the co-evolution of the community as a whole, including the people and the plants. And that is really such an important part of science that's appearing, you know, that nobody knew anything about a while ago, um, that we are part of a community that evolution, the old idea was evolution, that something evolved on its own, pop it, made a jump ahead or something. 
But now it appears that whole communities evolve and that changes occur within the community. At least that's a major uh, consideration. So, so you're, you, you gave me a, a good new idea. You gave our listeners a good idea there, I think. <laughs> mm, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting to look back at the history of herbalism and, and just to take American herbalism. When the first settlers came over, they were really not trained as medical doctors at the time, but they were clergymen, a lot of them. Yeah. And, you know, they could just take one class on medicine and combine it with folk medicine, and, and they were the doctors. And then it seems like around the 1930s when the pharmaceutical com company started and kind of had this break away from herbalism and folk medicine and, and started to really claim the orthodoxy of the time. Um, is this when you see the, the break away from herbalism as the, the principal way of treating? Well, the, the break was gradual. It began in the 1600s, um, and gee, see, there was a famous herbalist, Nicholas Culpepper, and there was a breakdown of censorship during the British-English Civil War, and he was able to publish all the secrets of the doctors, and that made them very mad, and people saw they were using ordinary herbs and stuff, and they wanted more esoteric things, and, and so they, they wanted things from afar, and trade items, and this and that, and, and that, that helped spur the the doctors away from herbalism and um, and set herbalism. Uh, that book's the only other book other than Bible, Culpepper's Herbal, that has been in print since 1652. <laughs> um, but at any rate, so the clergyman doctors there in the United States or Britain, 1700s, there would have been a lot of midwives and women herbalists as well, and just folk healers in general. Plus, the pioneers learned from the Native Americans a lot of valuable herbs and the Indian people were really better woodsmen than the pioneers and so they knew the woods and they learned and doctored and taught the pioneers a lot of different medicines and there was kind of a popularity of herbalism in the 19th century due to this influence I think from the Native American sources and then there was always medicine trying to stamp it out and you're right by the 20th century and especially from the 1930s on there was a very conscious effort to stamp out herbalism, and it's still operating. When you mend the badges of my clothing, you know every thread goes through my heart. Guessing that the river's gonna dry up Well, I said that's not the reason why we bar Looking around the corner where I left you Wondering what ever led me there Knowing that a quiet unconscious feeling Could be bought to drown a memory anywhere She said, I don't want your medicine And I don't need a sparrow in my heart when I'm covered by the thunder, I get rid of all your breath deep in my lungs. Spreading the wind apart. And when I touch the ceiling on a spring day, Wishing it could heat a baby crow So that they could lift me by my shoulders Take me from this frozen lake and let you know Just that I want to be your medicine I want to feed the sparrow in your heart When I'm covered by the thunder I get rid of all my breath deep in our lungs Spit in the wind of Standing round the corner where I left you 
Digging up a quiet sufficient trail Never knowing you're behind that angle With a tranquil lice of God in your sweet pan Oh, I want to be your medicine I want to feed the sparrow in your heart When we're covered by the sun Then we become just one and feel the lightning sharp I hear the word vitalism used a lot, and I was wondering if you could explain what vitalism is and, and how it relates to herbalism. Yeah, there's mechanism and vitalism. Mechanism is the idea that life forms are just like a machine, a fancy machine, and there is no vital force or chi or energy, life energy, that is behind all the processes. And I'd say, too, perhaps that that kind of tends to diminish any sort of idea of a presiding intelligence in the organism that runs the whole thing, and, and yet we know that does exist. Um, and so in vitalism, we put more emphasis on the fact that the, that the body acts like it's alive and, is, and that's different from inorganic material and that there's a vitality and that you can tell that by looking, at, you know, the mother can tell by looking at the child, he doesn't look right, he looks peaked. You know, the doctors don't really consider that anymore. They don't even hardly look at you, in fact. And they don't look at the vital functions and processes, and especially those that are just available to the eye or to the physical senses, which pick up very spontaneously, I think, when someone is sick or, or flourishing um, you know, among your friends. Oh, you don't look too well, you might say. Hmm. Yeah, so that's the essential difference. I would say I've gotten convinced that you could nail vitalism down to a chemical model and say that the the enzymes were what gives the vital force but um, even then there's still always a presiding intelligence and we still don't know what created life and how it got created so so there's still room for argument there but it doesn't really matter whether we believe as a doctrine in the vital force so long as we look for it we look for that vitality and we treat people not as if they're machines but as they're living beings <laughs> Now, another term that I, I've gotten mixed up about is homeopathy. What is homeopathy, and how is that different? Yeah, let's see. Homeopathy is related but different. The homeopathy, that means the cure is like homeo, the disease, pathy. So it means that we use a small amount of the hair of the dog that bit you. We use a small amount of a toxin that makes a set of symptoms, and so they would give somebody some, um, what's a good, belladonna, there's an, an herb that's used as a homeopathic because it's pretty toxic. So they'd give someone some belladonna or they would look through the poisoning histories and determine what all the symptoms caused by belladonna are, throbbing, pounding, red, feverish, pungent heat, and that's caused by it and that's what's cured, that's what it's used for. And so in homeopathy we tend to use poisons and not herbs. And we always use things like treats, like what it causes, it cures. Whereas in herbalism, herbalism is a lot more like food, and foods, you don't use what the food causes, that's what you use to cure. No, you eat the food because you need it. <laughs> you don't have the vitamin, you, need, you eat the vitamin. You don't have enough salt or too much salt, you adjust your salt levels. And usually with herbs, it pretty much fits that same pattern where... Um, your feet are cold, you just got chilled outside, so you drink a hot tea to warm up, you take a shower, etc. Only pass look upon that as um, treatment by opposites, hot to cold, and they disapprove of that. But that's, that's a very simple way that folk medicine is, has worked for thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. And, and, it, and let me say simply, it works. <laughs> so we use herbs that are warming, to warm up a system that's cooled off. We use herbs that are cooling to cool down a system that's too hot, overheated, and so on, or a relaxant. Like, I fly all over the place teaching, and honestly, if I get stuck, at, I'm on an international flight, and I don't have a good herb for muscle spasm cramping, my back's getting all sore, 
I order some ginger ale and I, <laughs> I'll put a little bit on my back. Um, I'll certainly drink it. And ginger, even in whatever form they they have it scrunched up in that little can, um, ginger is very a very good antispasmodic. It really um, relaxes spasms and cramps and things. And we would say it's an acrid warming herb, and acrid herbs generally are pharmacologically in that category. They just happen to be the ones that are usually um, relaxing. So herbs we use more like opposite treatment, hot to cold or relaxing to tense, etc. But can they can herbs and homeopathy work in conjunction with each other? Well, I believe they can. Um, I, homeopathy generally is not a very open-minded um, science. I would say that they're rather prejudiced against anything that seems like it might be suppressing, like the use of hot to cold. But, I, yeah, you can suppress things, but you, or you can just derange things. Like, I think using echinacea, which is stimulating, which raises the white count, etc. We know it raises the white, white blood cells. Well, is that what the body wants? We don't know that. And, yeah, that might help with immune problems, but but it might not be what the body needs. The body might be having some other problem. So using herbs in a conceptual way like that is counterproductive, and I agree with the homeopathic criticism there. But but herbs can be used very intelligently and to work with the vital force, to work with the intelligence of the body. It's kind of like if you're too cold, you, you warm the body up. It reminds it, oh, yeah, that's what it's like to be warm out. It stimulates the circulation out to the periphery, opens up the capillaries, changes the vascular dynamics, etc., or... Perhaps it acts on the metabolism, or I don't know if there's remedies that turn up energy production, but they're definitely ones that turn down energy production and cool us off. So, yeah. And from your experience of healing, what are people mostly suffering from today? Like, what are the epidemics and what are they caused by? Are there any generalizations we can draw well, I think that what we're seeing an enormous amount of in the last 10, 20 years more and more is autoimmune disease, and we didn't see much of that when I was a kid. I'm 60 now, just this year, and when I was in grade school, I mean, everybody my age talks about this. We never saw kids with asthma or chronic respiratory problems, and there probably were kids that were sick all the time but didn't go to school or something, but of, I mean, of all the kids I went to school with, nobody was chronically ill, but now there's just all this allergies. Yeah, okay, admittedly there were some allergies then, but, but there, there's deeper allergies. There's, in addition to asthma, it's getting into uh, enteritis, colitis, Crohn's disease. There's autoimmune diseases of various kinds. They're just becoming more and more common, and those diseases are due to overactivity of the immune system. It's, it's been triggered. It's been, it's been irritated by substances, by, probably by toxins in the environment, or by vaccines and things like that, which are controversial. The old herbalists, I don't think, saw very much of this because if you look at Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic, or Western herbalism, almost all the major herbs they used were warming. They warmed people up. It's obvious people were getting too cold all the time, whereas nowadays it's like this overly hot condition caused by an autoimmune excess. So that's the main thing I see occurring more and more. Our foods and our environment are getting so polluted and... And it's just having a cumulative effect, I think, generation by generation. I call it the war on the next generation. And I, I just think, oh, my God, how can people continue with this? But making money is more important than having healthy kids, I think. And it's disturbing. And they're kind of in denial about how many sick kids there are and, and that it has anything to do with these uh, industrial wastes and agricultural pesticides and foods that aren't as good and so on and so forth. Um, 30 years into herbalism, your introduction is slightly out of date, <laughs> and I've seen these changes over that time, and I used to be a fanatic herbalist and homeopath and thought everything was treatable by, by you know, herbs and, and remedies. Now I see the importance of eating and foods is just so terribly important. Diet is number one and exercise number two. Um, exercise would be just as important, but diet is maybe more important because we have to avoid some toxins as much as we can, and we have to um, then eat healthy as well. So, for instance, like gluten intolerance has kind of come out of nowhere, and I, I myself am gluten intolerant and finally stopped eating wheat about three years ago. and made a great difference for myself, and 
you know, 10 years ago, not very many people even were thinking about gluten intolerance. And there may be changes in the wheat, in the genome of the wheat, or the way it's processed, or several different changes going on that have made people more sensitive, etc. The wheat has more gluten in it, for one thing. Yeah, I experienced that for myself. I was getting migraines and really bad digestive issues, and um, I thought I was eating relatively healthy, and I just couldn't figure out why I was getting these really intense pains. And finally, an herbalist told me, well, you need to cut out gluten and see what that does for you. And it was really hard for me to think that it was gluten because I was eating sprouted grains. I was, I thought okay. I was, you know, I thought I was kind of clear of that. But it was actually really incredible. The moment I cut out gluten within a few weeks, I didn't have the migraines or the stomach pain anymore. Um, yeah. Diet is, is so important. And yes, about eating the healthy foods, but also about staying away from these overly processed yeah. foods. Like you said, there's been so many simultaneous changes occurring in our food system that we don't really know what effects they're having on us. I mean, we do. We're seeing that we're getting sicker. Yeah. Just to give an example in farming practices, changes um, which occurred in the last you know, five to 15 years is um, at the end of the season, they just spray Roundup on everything and kill everything. And I mean, that includes the wheat. That way it's dried out. It's not going to need to be dried, and then they do no-till. It's better ecologically in a way. There's less um, erosion in the next spring. But that's how they harvest foods. Well, I mean, that's an incredible change, you know. I mean, Roundup is not known to be safe <laughs> and uh, kills a lot, mighty awful lot of plants. And, um, um, you know, and it's kind of our cellular level of existence is a lot like plants. And, at any rate, so that's just one thing that's going on now. The crimes being committed against the earth in the name of agriculture, just the stupidity, the lack of even a remedial understanding of ecology, could fill volumes, and I'm just hoping we're close to rock bottom. Well, won't you lend your lungs to me? Mine are collapsing Plant my feet and bitterly breathe up the time that's passing Breath I'll take and breath I'll give And pray the day's not poison Stand among the ones that live in lonely indecision Where fingers walk the darkness down Mind is on the midnight Gather up the gold you found Your foolish only moonlight if you try to take it home, your hands will turn to butter. You better leave this dream alone. Try to find another. Salvation sat and crossed yourself. Call the devil partner. Wisdom burned upon a shelf who'll kill the raging cancer. Seal the river at its mouth. Take the water prisoner. Fill the sky with screams and cries, bathing fiery answers. Where well, Jesus was an only son. Love is only concept of strangers crying foreign tongues and dirty up the doorstep. And I for one and you for two ain't got the time for outside. Keep your injured looks to you, and we'll tell the world that we try. For people who are new to herbalism, um, they will go into a health food store or an herb shop and there's racks of wonderful tinctures and herb jars. But I'm wondering maybe if we could just pick, you know, three to five herbs that people can start with that are easy to get to know and to learn and um, have some good overall benefits. Yeah. Well, I would say herb number one 
the uh, elder, which I mentioned earlier, um, fairly well proven antiviral, so it's good for acute viral diseases, and that's uh, and it may even be for more serious viral diseases as well. It's pretty well proved out both experientially, which is important, and test-wise, uh, scientific testing as well. Everybody should, should have some elderberry or elderflower syrup or extract around. So in Europe, everybody would have that. <laughs> they also use it as a cooling drink in the summertime. And um, that would be number one. I'd say then some wound remedies like calendula, which is used by both homeopaths and herbalists for cuts in general, of severe cuts. If you're working with sharp tools and instruments, I'd have some yarrow around, um, cuts that really bleed extensively. Um, for bruises, you can use yarrow or arnica used in homeopathy. So those are all very important. Um, we've long used St. John's wort, which is controversial because it, from we were using it happily by ourselves and then they came along and it's an antidepressant, blah, blah, blah. No, no, it's not an antidepressant. No, it's not safe. It's safe. It doesn't even have that constituent. Yes, it has that, and so on and so forth. And then it was found that it helps the liver break down uh, drugs, so it shortens uh, how long a drug will, will work for a person. And um, so that is a problem. If you're on drugs, you've got to watch it with uh, St. John's Wort. But St. John's Wort is good for mild depression, and it's good for... Um, for wounds to nerves, and it's good externally on and on pinch nerves and spinal pains. It might not cure, but I'll usually cut down on inflammation along a nerve. Well, what other ones? Yarrow can also be used as an anti-fever remedy, and depending on what the problems are in your household, you know, like peppermint, peppermint oil soothes the stomach, or ginger. Oh, I love ginger. Ginger is one of the best antispasmodics, so it's one of the best liniments. That's a remedy to put on your muscles. So, yeah, I would include ginger in the top five. In terms of getting the, the medicine in, some people talk about drinking as a tea or tinctures. Do you have a favorite way of ingesting the herbs? Well, I do like the tinctures the best um, because you can preserve the fresh plant right in the tincture pretty darn well. And I believe there's benefits to that. But Otherwise, then, we would use teas or tablets or capsules, and they all are the dry herb. And they have a shorter shelf life, I'd say maybe a year. Mm, you might need more of it. I find you can use smaller amounts of a tincture made from the fresh plant. Uh, and I, my preference is for tinctures, but they, uh, they have alcohol in them, which some people don't want. And even I have herbalists down, down south, herbalist friend who you know lives in a dry county. People just don't, they don't approve of the use of alcohol down there. <laughs> and what about tincturing in glycerin? Yeah, that works for a lot of plants. You can't always extract it in glycerin. It doesn't extract as well. Uh, but if it's, oh, you can extract it in water and or water and some alcohol and then preserve it the rest of the way with the glycerin. Um I'm not expert with, with glycerin. Yeah, I have heard that glycerin doesn't work for all plants. Yeah. And that's one of the downsides, but it does taste better. <laughs> now, another question I have, if we're wild crafting around our areas, is it true that plants from one's own bioregion are more powerful than foreign ones? And if not, what ecosystems have some of the most powerful medicines? Oh, great question. Yeah, well, I think many of us presume that the herbs growing in the same region where you live, where I live, um, that those are the natural medicines for us. And I think there probably is truth to that. But I'd also say that herbs are some of the oldest trade items in the world. I mean, they would go back to, like, flint <laughs> being carried around. Uh, by uh, tr traders from one part of the world to another. You know, a lot of the herbs, like the culinary herbs, ginger, cardamom, um, cinnamon, have been traded since the Roman period or earlier than that. So there just are some great herbs that are great around the world. Wherever you use them, they are great herbs. There's just something about them, like I'd say ginger for us, basm to muscle, or arnica or yarrow for a bruise. They're just so tremendous that way. 
I myself like to use the herbs that I see and know in my bioregion, the temperate region of North America or Europe or maybe China. And I just feel more comfortable with that. But I, I also think maybe that's a prejudice. I don't know if it's justified. I don't know that there's places in the world that grow better herbs, except we have in the United States probably the greatest temperate region forest in the world. Like in the Ohio Valley, there's something like 220 different native hardwoods, and um, that's phenomenal. We have the best hardwood forest in the world. Whereas, I mean, I go, I go to Europe, like we have like 30 oaks here, and in Europe they have like one oak, you know. <laughs> we have five maples, you know, in the upper Midwest, and there they have one maple. <laughs> and so um, we have great variety. China is also has some variety, but... Um, not maybe as much. So this temperate region forest is a biodiverse area that's really great. And we a lot of our excellent herbs, black coash, blue coash, trillium, uh, so on, those have kind of specialized uses, but they come from that bioregion. We learn about them from the Native American people of, the, of that bioregion. I call those heritage gifts. They're precious gifts of knowledge from the Native people. So, hmm. You know, kind of stemming off the idea of bioregionalism. I'm very interested in the interface of herbalism with the wider resistance to industrial civilization and transition to earth-based mutualist existence. And I'm wondering, how is practicing herbalism an act of resistance, or do you see it as an act of resistance? Boy, I sure do. Yeah. Like, I was born to a family of <laughs> heretics, like, uh, I'm a 10th generation Quaker on my father's side, and so that's like pacifist resistance, this, that, and the other thing. And then my mother's side, my grandfather was uh, secretary of the War Resisters League in World War II, so so they were pacifists and and uh, r radicals on that side as well. And um, I just took that in a different direction, and um, I I don't care as much for politics as some of my relatives, but but um, you know, being an herbalist turned out to be political too, and I know the first five years that I was an herbalist, I was afraid all the time I'd be arrested by the FDA. It's like, really, they didn't care about me at all, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and they maybe care slightly more about herbalists today. They're on the radar slightly, but they care about products, you know, more than herbalists. But we were afraid of them in the herb store in the old days. And then we went on, we learned that, no, they're not going to arrest us. And, you know, they're looking for certain things. And occasionally there'd be some product that'd be recalled or this or that. But so that's different. Um, but over the years, we had to fight in Minnesota with the Board of Medical Practice, and we got freedom of choice really for consumers to choose whatever they wanted, that they could have uh, access to alternative medicine. We couldn't really phrase it as our right to practice, but their right to receive what we had to offer. So that became a law that we passed in Minnesota about 2000, and there's now about 12, 13 states that have the freedom of, um, I'm not sure what it's called. They, I remember the the legislator saying, don't call it free choice. Nothing to do with choice. <laughs> it's like, okay, that'll doom it. You can't talk about choice. <laughs> so we called it something else. So little by little, we have established our legal footing that way. And then also, about the same time, acupuncture became uh, licensed in Minnesota and is licensed probably 40 states and maybe 45, almost, almost all the states. And naturopathy is licensed in maybe I don't know if it's 12, 20, whatever states. Um, so there's been some proceeding both in licensed and un unlicensed practitioners. So, And products, on the other hand, I have to say, has tightened up some. The FDA has gotten more teeth in a way, um, which was good and bad, because originally the FDA could kind of do whatever they want and stomp on anybody. And um, we got the Deshay Law through in 1993, uh, Dietary Supplement Education Act, and our two sponsors of that were Orrin Hatch and Tom Harkin. So you can see it was across the aisle, both liberals and conservatives. So it's still probably one of the few things that both sides of the aisle can you know, find people that support alternative medicine. And they passed this bill, which gave the FDA more directions on how to regulate the field, and that's been both good and bad. But uh, at any rate, we have many more freedoms than Europe. I just was over in Europe, and it's just unbelievable. In Europe, they can pass laws that just put businesses out of business. Boom. And they don't care. It's like, oh, well, we want to regulate it this way. So, 
I've heard there's a big debate in the herbal community about whether to require licensing, which supposedly would ensure the integrity of practicing herbalists, or to allow herbalism to continue to be autonomous and independent of bureaucracy. Where do you stand on this? Uh, yeah, that is a big fight. I would say, though, it's about 80-90% against licensing, 10% in favor, but there's a deep paranoia among the people that don't want licensure, and um, there's also practicality there too. I, I do th I'm against licensure myself, but uh, I also know from our experience in Minnesota, medicine is not federally licensed, so you have to go state by state. You would have to get licensure in one state after another after another, <laughs> and it would take you know a century as naturopathy is still not fully licensed in all the states, and so it's not easy, and that costs a lot of money. Back when we were working, lobbying the legislature, lobbyists cost $500 an hour. <laughs> so, And I'd love if you would paint us a picture of what it was like to be an herbalist 30 years ago, how you were viewed, you know, what the zeitgeist was like, and how it's different from today. An interesting question, yeah. 30 years ago, I was working in the herb store, began there, and we were much more paranoid, at least I was. Um, and actually, we had come through a period when they had really actively persecuted herbalists and thrown people in jail and stuff like that through the 50s and 60s. And um, they no longer really cared that much about it. And, or at least they left a period there when they didn't regulate it, and there it went wildfire crazy. So it's too well established now to wipe out. But back there 30 years ago in the early 80s, it it, it was not as popular and well known. Even if you knew about it, it was hard to find a place to get herbs or to find anybody who knew anything. And in the 70s, there was really only a couple herbalists in the whole country had gotten down to just a few practitioners, or at least people with a national presence. And so then we had to build up from there. And I'd say it's much more accepted, and we know a lot more. I think herbalism has advanced a lot. And developed and people have innovated and brought in new ideas or brought back old ideas so that practice uh, is more sensible and people can actually help people. It's not as much guesswork. It's more scientific in the sense of a system of knowledge. Um, I'd like to talk about the ecological threats to our plant medicine. In a world with 7.2 billion people, I wonder about the fate of plant populations since herbalism is gaining popularity today. It's quite possible there were incredible medicines that were over-harvested to extinction previously. But I'm wondering, do you see wildcrafting as a sustainable source for most herbs, or should we only be using cultivated herbs? And furthermore, what are the environmental concerns facing herbs? One effort that I know of is the United Plant Savers, who are doing tremendous work to protect plants from all kinds of human activity. Yeah, well, plants have been used for hundreds of thousands of years, and generally um, sensible, ethical, as we call it, wild crafting actually often spreads the population, although there just are plants that just can't be spread, that, that just uh, take too long to grow, like orchids, uh, or like the lady slipper, which nobody uses today because it would be unethical, because it, it takes 17 years for the orchid to produce the flower, the lady slipper, and then it could be a hundred years old and you pick it and boom, you know. <laughs> so uh, Trillium that I mentioned is somewhat in the same book, but I use it in small amounts. That's my way of being um, ecological with it because it's very valuable for endometriosis. It's really quite a great herb there. So there's some herbs that you really can't ethically, you can't wildcraft. It's just no longer possible. And there's others that if we watch it and do it right, things will be okay. And things should be, uh, peop I think wildcrafters should be always conscious and aware. And through the whole herb commerce, that questions should be asked. And we should know that the people who are picking the herbs not only know what they're doing and what herb is what, but the ecological issues. And then there's regionalism where um, something is rare in one area but common in another area. So 
it can be picked in one area, but in the other area it shouldn't be, or it should, or the population should be built up. It's best, of course, to raise things agriculturally and to uh, intentionally grow them. Even like ginseng's woods grown, that means it's grown in the woods, kind of like its natural environment. And ginseng can barely be grown sustainably. That plant that's been in the wild overpicked when it wasn't being grown like that. And that's certainly one plant that really should pretty much only be used as woods grown. And, of course, if you're a big company and you want to sell something, you don't want it to run out. So they also have some reason for keeping the populations going. I would say the biggest threat, you asked about threats to herbal populations, is not overpicking probably by herbalists so much as uh, deforestation and um, destruction of habitat. And there's no doubt that plant populations are not entirely wiped out, but much rarer due to the forestry over the last 150, 200 years. And I wish that all these economic uses of the woods were combined so that people saw the value in the plants on the ground, in the forest products that can be made, taken out of the forest, as well as the trees, so they didn't just clear cut all the time, but realized what was on the ground. I, I've known people who found forests, uh, you know, where the Trees have been clear-cut, and there was hundreds of ginsengs, you know, that really had to be picked because they'd all die because ginseng needs shade. Or even lady slippers, the same thing. So uh, sensible forestry practices would be nice as well. <laughs> yeah, habitat loss, especially deforestation, is a huge detriment with cascading effects throughout ecosystems. Probably the number one threat to biodiversity and climate change, with the rising temperatures and changes in precipitation, just complicates things and really compounds the challenges and destruction. Have you noticed in your travels the effects of climate change on plant populations? Well, certainly, like the western pine forests, like with the uh, pine beetle, and then uh, there's just a massive, sometimes you can see it from airplanes, sometimes from roads. There's a massive whole counties, you know, of forests just die. And it's not just because of the pine beetle, but because the trees are weakened by drought and stress. And so these changes on the macro level that's very observable in the trees, that's already changing. And that's changing the flora on the ground in those types of forests. There was a lady from the north You'd scarce would find her marrow She was courted by nine gentlemen And a ploughboy lad from yeah. These are nine sat drinking at the wine As they have done before And they made a vow amongst themselves To fight where in my She's a gold as hair, she's washed his face As she has done before Gave him a brand down by his side
What are some simple steps that people can start taking、uh, to learn more about herbs and plants, and maybe start on the journey of healing not only our own bodies but the earth body around us? Well, I think that growing and making your own herb products is a lot of fun. People can do that. People like anything to do with the kitchen can can enjoy herbalism a lot that way. And then you need some basic guides that are like,、um, you know, people friendly herbal. And and there's a lot of guides like that.、Um, I'd say like the New Holistic Herbal by David Hoffman, or the Family Herbal by Rosemary Gladstar, or my own、uh, the Book of Herbal Wisdom, are all books that are real approachable for the layperson, and are kind of geared towards、um, common health problems.、And、then I'd say. Uh, if you have a complex problem, you should try and get a hold of a herbalist. You can get a hold of an herbalist from the American Herbalist Guild website. Would have a list of their practitioners, or just asking, or looking up online, or something like that. So, for our internet connected listeners, you can go to woodherbs.com, where you'll find more about Matthew's practice, his philosophy, where he'll be teaching next. And if you can't get enough, you can even read his dissertation on the conceptual foundations of Western herbalism. Oh, and you'll also see all of his wonderful books that I encourage you to get a copy of. Matthew, this has been an enlightening conversation, and I'll turn it over to you if you have any final thoughts you'd like to share. Well, I would say I've been on a number of radio programs and interviews and. You've asked some of the best questions of anybody so far, so I really think you're you're、uh, smart. <laughs> to、wow. put it simply. <laughs> oh my gosh! Thank you. That is such a huge compliment. I'm I'm gonna put that in my pocket and take it with me the rest of the week. <laughs> Don't edit that out. <laughs> you were one of the first teachers that I heard about when I was getting into herbalism up in Oregon. You were teaching at the traditional school of Western herbalism, and since then, I have really wanted to learn from you. I was blessed to study with Cascade Anderson Geller, who will always be close to my heart, and、yeah. she really helped me cultivate a life way in relationship with plants. Yes. So, yes. I think we have to make a switch to a more ecological. Eating and living and medicining too, so it's、mm-hmm. going to be forced on us. If we're not doing it voluntarily, as far as I can see, so <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. kind of how I see it as well. You know,、um, change is not likely to be voluntary, and that's a shadow world I visit often in my mind. Whether we call it collapse or the great turning or a paradigm shift. People are becoming aware of a monumental change that is inevitable, voluntary or not.、Um, yeah. I just wonder what it will take for people in the West to rise up and take some responsibility and recognize we don't have to be passive recipients, and we can refuse to consume the poison, the lifestyle, the convenient creature comforts. And we can take meaningful action for the plants, for the habitats that nourish us and heal us. I look forward to a simple bioregional life where we learn to navigate the land as a home and an extension of ourselves. I see the chronic depression and dissatisfaction and wounds. Falling away as we shed the complications of this technocratic society and move towards a Gaian perspective. Yeah, I think also our medicine is one area where I think we are going to have to adopt alternatives quicker than maybe some other areas because there aren't good antivirals and there still are epidemics and things and.、Um, Public health may suffer some. There's new diseases because people travel so much. We hear about it a couple times a year now about some new disease showing up on our shores, quote unquote. That never used to happen because people just didn't move around very much. <laughs> 
with the diseases, but also the pollutants and toxins. It's so important to boost our immune systems with our plant allies. Although I do resonate with your approach of not spending energy to resist an illness. Yeah. But to listen to its message and correct the imbalance. Um, yeah, that's why I use small amount of herbs. I don't want to. You don't want to force the body to do anything. You don't want to kill bacteria. You want to change the environment so they don't want to live there. That's the surefire way to get rid of bacteria, because they live in a certain environment, and if it's not there, they won't live there. Sometimes, I mean, there are times when there are bacteria that are just pretty nasty and they have to be killed. But by and large, most acute diseases, it's just a matter of changing the environment so that they don't want to live there. I've seen that countless times. <laughs> so this was really wonderful. Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on Unlearn and Rewild. Our music today was from the tallest man on earth with the sparrow and the medicine, followed by Towns Van Zant with a tune called Lungs, and lastly, Bert Yanch singing Yarrow. Our theme song is Like a River by Kate Wolf. Our producer is March Young. Yeah.